I, 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 there was something that I you know, got sort of flustered about last time that I just wanted to clarify briefly. Um, and that, in this proof of the Morse model, I was saying, you know, what, let, let me just sort of summarize the proof of the Morse model. Was, was basically say that um, we, we, we expressed our function f of x as equal to some quadratic form, q sub x, which depended upon x, evaluated at the point x, which is sort of the strangest thing, right? So q, for each point x, we have a quadratic function, but the, we're not, you know, we're not evaluating that function over, over all the plane, we're just evaluating that function at x. Um, and it's worth thinking a little bit about what that means. Sort of um, evaluating the, uh, you know, it's like saying any function can be sort of looks, it looks like a quadratic function at each point, but where, anyway, it, it, so this is where we got. And, and then we said, well, and, but the other thing we knew was that q sub zero, quadratic form at zero, was equal to this, the, the Hessian. Um, and that's non degenerate. And be, um, because that's non degenerate, non degeneracy is an open condition, therefore this Q sub x is going to be non degenerate for x close to 0. Okay, so Q sub x, non degenerate. All x close to 0. And now we think of the action of GLN on the space of non degenerate quadratic forms. Um, and we say that if, if I'm moving by a small, um, if I have a non-degenerate quadratic form and I move it a little bit, I can realize that motion by, um, by, uh, by precomposing with a linear automorphism. So I say Q sub x can be thought of as Q sub 0 precomposed with um, Maybe I'll say q sub x of vector u is equal to q sub 0 of h sub x of u, where h sub x is a linear <coughs> automorphism. And um, the reason for that was that if you think about the action of GLN on the vector space of quadratic forms, then it has various orbits, and the non degenerate ones are open orbits. Um, and there are lots of different ones, to, but they're basically just given by the signature. The number of minuses is plus when you diagonalize them. So any two with the same signature are linear equivalent. Okay. So, so there, is, is, is having the same signature in the definition? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, we need to know that. Right. So the point actually, is, signature is a discrete quantity. Ah, I see. Okay. So you can't. So you can't signature can't jump. The only way you can change signature is by first failing to have a signature. I mean, being non degenerate, I mean, being degenerate. So you can yes. go, you know, you, it's sort of like these rooms, these chambers inside the space of, non -de of, of s quadratic forms, <coughs> which are those with not those non degenerate ones, and there are walls between them, which are the degenerate ones. And the signature jumps across all those walls. Okay. Um, but anyway, so, so the point is that these, uh, the partitioning of non degenerate ones according to signature, corresponds precisely to partitioning of it into orbits under GLN. So that's some theorem, theorems from linear algebra. Um, but the point is then, if you move, if you change your quadratic form a little bit, you can realize by starting with a fixed quadratic form and, and then uh, just precomposing with this linear algorithm. And so then we said, okay, so therefore f of x equals q0 of hx of x. And then I wanted to say with well, hx of x as a function being defined to that p of x or hx of x. And that's a map from Rn to Rn, or from a neighbor to the origin to a neighbor to the origin. And then I said that's a local diffeomorphism. All you need to do to compute that's a local diffeomorphism is compute the derivative of phi at the origin. And I said that's not is non singular. And so, the, uh, in fact, it is equal to um, the identity, um, in fact, zero. I mean, it's sort of what you think of it. Oh, and the other thing about this h, right? h sub zero equals the identity. 
and I claim this is equal to the identity. But the way to think about it a little bit more carefully is to think about so why. Um, if you think about this, you can think about h sub x all by itself, right? This is, think of it just a matrix. In my matrix, where the code entries are functions of x, right? And so this is, you can think of it as the identity, because it's the identity, I mean, start with the Taylor series approximation, it's the identity plus, um, you know, first order terms. I mean, just each entry of a sub x is a function of x, and so it's the identity plus stuff. Well, let's, I just say higher order, but I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm a little odd on that, you know what I mean, right? Um, linear stuff and, and higher. Um, and then when you point to them, when you multiply h sub x, h sub x of x, you think of it as h sub x matrix times of x of x, then you're multiplying each of these things by x, and so then it becomes you know, the identity times x plus quadratic terms. Quadratic and higher stuff. And so therefore the derivative is there. Um, x. The derivative at the origin is the end. It's just the end. And once you know the derivative is the identity, therefore it's non singular at the origin, and so in the neighborhood it's non singular, so it's local. Okay. Um, now, we're, the next thing I want to do is talk about why this um, non non degeneracy of the Hessian is um, actually now I'm gonna step I I I want to motivate a little more what I'm going to say about the transversality condition. I want to talk about why non, uh, non degeneracy of the Hessian is really a transversality condition. Um, but suppose there's something that comes up a lot, which is um, Suppose you want to prove a parametrized Morse. This is called, this is the Morse line. Suppose you want to prove, prove a parametrized Morse line. So suppose you have F sub T, right? Um, and you have this F sub T um, depending on T, and this suppose this is going to be uh, non degenerate Hessian for all t. Okay. Then you'd like to say, can I get, can I prove that, um, uh, so you're given this, and then you want to show that, um, I won't write, I'm well, You want to prove the Morse lemma as a function of t, so you want to prove that you can find that the critical points move around smoothly with t, and you have coordinate system moving around smoothly with t, um, such that in that smoothly moving coordinate system, the function takes a standard uh, form. So you want to show standard forms uh, in coordinates moving with t. Coordinates moving smoothly with t. Um, so, the first thing you would need to do is sort of find this, um, find this particular critical point about which to send. You, you, the first thing you need to do is find this zero. I mean, the, the, everything's, everything we've done will sort of work quite nicely if you have, you know, f sub t of x will be q, q sub x and t, um, depending upon x. The only problem is that your, your critical point might be moving. And so the first step you need to get some argument like this going where you have a parameter running is you need to sort of reparameterize the domain so the critical point doesn't move. The critical point stays at the origin. But in order to need, do that, you need to know that the critical point stays. We need to know that the critical points are isolated and stay and sort of don't, that we don't suddenly have. We, in this argument, we didn't really need to know the critical point was isolated. It's a consequence of the critical point being isolated. We sort of didn't need to know it right away. Um, we just knew that there was a, there was a critical point. We did everything around that critical point. Right? Um, here you have it. Um, 
anyway, the easiest way to get this, I guess, I guess if you run this through at each time t, you'll get that it's isolated. And then you can go back and say, okay, now I've got an isolated point that's varying smoothly with time. Therefore, I can reparameterize so that isolated point is a fixed point. And then I can run it that way. Um, but the easier way is to go, is to step back and say there's non general Hessian is a, um, is a transversality condition. And then the critical points become transverse points of intersection. And then you can, if it's moving around in the domain, you can find a one parameter family diffeomorphism that makes it not move. By just doing, you know, any any kind of path of a point, you can you can find an ambient isotopy that you pre post compose with, so that point doesn't you know, doesn't move, and uh, you need that to get started for a parameterized morseland. So I'm going to try to do a parameterized morseland in, in a few lectures, but I want to work up to it by first um, uh, getting everything in one param, you know, at fixed time sorted out, and hopefully the transversality <coughs> understanding will help us get that. Um, so we're trying to show that, so the next claim is that, um, I think I used some funny notation before, uh, so I think of D, DF, I'm going to write this way, DF um, as a section, I'm going to write this as transverse to Z, I'm going to call it Z. Um, Z is the zero section of the cotemporal body, if and only if um, uh, questions. Uh, so Z, DF, and Z are both maps from the manifold M to the cotangent bundle. Um, Z is the one that takes uh, any point P to the zero vector at that point P, and DF takes DF. And so, um, to see this transversality, we just have to set everything up in local coordinates, and we were, um, so we had local coordinates. First, we had local coordinates x1 up to xn on m, and then we got local coordinates. Um, did I call them x1 as well on uh, t star? Did I call them y? Then we had y1 up to yn, and, and then th those were the vector coordinates, or the, the x1s and y1s, is that what I had then on? You used u1 for u1 for u1. Okay, that's right, and u1 for u1, that's right. On t star n. <coughs> so the point is, these are really those, right? And then these are really the derivatives, right? So if I have a vector, of the form, I'll just remind you, so if I have a vector v, which is equal to uh, v, which is equal to a1, uh, the x1, at p plus a2, the x2 and v, at f plus a, and the xn, you want to use, anyway, then yi of v is just equal to xi of p, and then um, ui of v is just equal to the coefficient ai. Okay? Um, and so we sort of have this picture where you use the x's. These are, the, uh, these are the y's and these are the u's. Um, and then, now if I have a function, um, so this is, so df is a section and z is a section. Sections locally are graphs of functions. Right? Um, so df um, is really the function, df of x1 up to xn is really x1 up to xn, comma, and then partial. The coefficients are partial f with respect to x1, partial with respect to xn. Right, so these are the y coordinates and the same as the x coordinates. Um, 
And so transversality, if I want to be transverse to the zero section here, um, I'm assuming, let's say I'm at a point where that is zero. Right? This is the grab. Um, all I really want to know is that when it hits zero at this critical point, um, the, 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 the derivative of that function, right? So I just think of, um, I want to think of this as equal to g of x1 of xn. And then I'm just thinking of g as a function from rn to rn, where g of x equals uh, that's just the gradient of this. One of x. And an x. I mean, the point is these have the same dimension. So transversality is just simply saying that where this, where this intersection occurs, um, the, uh, the derivative, is, this, this linear linearization of this thing should be um, surjective. Okay? Um, because the tan, or let's, let's, let's take that slightly more slowly. The, the, for transversality, right, I have the zero, I have the zero section and the graph of the function. Their tangent spaces to those two submanifolds should uh, add up to the tangent space of the whole thing. This zero section is giving me all the x1 tangent, all the x tangent directions. So all I need to make sure is that out of this I get all of the uh, vertical directions. And that's just precisely saying that, um, you know, so that a tangent vector to this will be this plus the derivative of it, right? right. Anyway, if you think about it, what you really want to know is the projection onto the vertical direction is surjective. And the projection on the vertical direction is precisely this, the derivative of this function. So you need to know that dg, capital dg, is surjective. But surjective here in this case is just an isomorphism. So we need that DG um, is uh, an isomorphism. But the derivative of that function then will report its precise impression. Because you're taking all the second derivative. That makes sense? tangent vector to the graph. I mean, this is something I, I remember getting confused about, you know, teaching first year of calculus or maybe second year of calculus. What's a, what's a tangent vector to the graph of a function of a few variables, right? It's a tangent vector to the graph is given by, you know, it's given by a vector in this direction and the plus the derivative applied plus this. So this is, if this is a vector v, then if this is a graph, um, this, then you know, call this function, call this function h or something, right? This function right here. If this is v, then you um, take, sorry, dg equals graph of g, right? And so this vector v is dg of v, and then the tangent vector is the sum of those two. The tangent vector to the graph is the sum of those two. So then you subtract off these vectors and you get those vectors. And that's all you need to do. Get, you can get all the vertical vectors this way. Um, so, so the next thing I want to do then is give you kind of a slightly angry the argument as to why um, we can always return a given function so that d f of a is transverse to the zero section. That's going to prove that more functions exist. Okay. Um, so next. So it'd be great if we could just sort of apply the transversality there and say, well, just wiggle df a little bit, right? But the problem is you're not you can't if you wiggle df a little bit, it's probably no longer closed as a as a one form. 
and therefore it's probably, therefore it's not not likely to be d of a function. If you want it to stay d, of, you want it to wiggle f, not df. The goal is to wiggle f so that df ends up being transverse, and that's harder than just wiggling df. Um, and um, the idea is going to be that. You wiggle f by adding linear functions. <coughs> so there are two issues with this. One is um, what's going to be linear. In, you know, one is to show that sort of locally you can do this. If you want to make it transverse, you only need to add a linear function in in some local coordinates. And the second thing is well. Linear functions aren't, aren't bump functions. You've got to cut them off if you want to pass, do the sort of wiggling globally on, a, on some manifold. And so you want to cut them off in a way that doesn't, you, know, you want some way to start improving things bit by bit, but then not, when you improve something over here, not screw up what you are dealing with there. And that's, that's the, you know, the, that's where I'm going to be a little hand wavy, but the, I think that the, if I can convince you intuitively that you could write down the epsilons and deltas appropriately to see that that works. Um, and, uh, but the first thing I just want to show that locally you can um, uh, you, you can make df transverse by adding linear functions. Um, and before I even show that, which just seems to be, you know, why is that the right thing? I mean, so for example, if I just take just in one variable, <coughs> I mean, it's not obvious that if you take some, I mean, our, our, our prototypical example is say x cubed, right? And we know that if we add x, if we take x cubed and we add, say, some small tx, right, we've already seen that's a good example where it becomes, the Hessian becomes non-degenerate, right? You, you go from this to this to either this, which gives you two non-degenerate critical points or no critical points at all. So you either move the, the either this thing ceases to have a um, transverse intersection, at all. It, it ceases to have any intersection with the zero section, or it develops two. Um, but what about, you know, what about x to the fourth? What if you do x to the fourth plus tx? You know, first you might think, hmm, this is not going to really improve matters somehow, but actually adding a linear function to x to the fourth just slightly tilts, right? That, I mean, this is very crude what happens, but it slightly tilts that, that flattened off thing, and it makes it, I mean, it, for a small t, you can reparameter. Well, the main thing is you can just compute, right? So your your uh, you know this is f of f sub t of x. Then you just compute the derivative f t prime of x is x to the fourth plus t. So the critical point occurs at um, this uh, fourth root or something, but um, and then you want to know the second derivative then. And the second derivative then is for x cubed. You might think, oh, that's bad because it's still uh, it's still degenerate, right? This is still equal to zero, but it's it's equal to zero at zero. I I skip some x cubed or whatever some number x squared. Happy, okay, right? Wasn't it important that you get x squared? What's important is that what what I wanted to emphasize here is that. Um, the uh, we're not getting a constant here. Okay. What I wanted to emphasize is that it, you might think that this is what, what do we want? We want the second derivative to be positive or negative. I mean, we don't want it to be zero, right? And this looks like it's zero, but the key thing is that the critical points no longer at zero. So the critical point is moved. If you set this equal to zero and solve, the critical point's something somewhere, right? Not zero. And so at that point where it's not zero, this thing is. So by moving the critical point, um, you've managed to get the Hessian to be zero. Um, and uh, um, actually, really, the same phenomenon happens here too. And so um, that, that's going to be the idea that you can, you, can, you can clean everything up by adding linear functions. Um, but then the more formal way to say it is um, one, so I don't know how you would have you would have seen a proof of the transversality theorem, but the sort of the, um, the basic transversality theorem that, um, 
from which other transversality theories can be proved is if you have some function uh, phi from some animal m into r k cross r l, any, any smooth function, right? Then, so I want to think of this as just, it's important that I split this, you know, this r m, but it's split into horizontal directions and vertical directions, right? Then, um, uh, let me actually I probably want to make it a disk. Uh, I'll just say there exists a um, open dense um, uh, subset of um, subset of the neighborhood of zero in which uh, which direction do I want? It doesn't really matter. Um, in in R L. Some call this neighborhood nu or something, such that for all y in nu, um, phi, this map phi is transverse to rk cross y. If we're interested in making it transverse to, uh, if I think of this as the vertical direction, right? Think of this space. I'm thinking of this as a, uh, actually, no, I'm thinking, I guess I'm thinking the other way around. I'm thinking of rk going this way. But it's a, so I'm sort of there because I want to make it transverse to sections, right? And so um, here, here's the zero section of this local bundle. Right? This is a locally trivial piece of the bundle. Here's the zero section, and here's this function, which may not be transverse to the zero section at all. Um, and then I want to say, well, I can just add, I, I get, if I, um, some nearby sections, it'll be zero, it'll, it'll be transverse to it. So I'm not going to prove this, this is sort of a, a, a standard way to start. Um, so some neighbor of the origin and some open set in an open uh, dense subset in which it's transverse to all those nearby things. Uh, of course, you might, you know, when you first think about this, you think, wait a minute, this map would be arbitrarily horrible. It could map everything to a point or something. Well, that's great. If it maps everything to a point, then you make, you know, you just take some section that doesn't intersect it at all, and it's transverse. So it's not, we're not, this doesn't say anything about how nice phi is, it just says you can. Uh, so what are you sitting on? <coughs> smooth. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So it can't be that. Right, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, but smooth maps can be pretty horrible. So. Um, it can have pretty horrendous similarities. Um, but another way to say that is um, equivalently, that's equivalent to saying that um, you know, for all y in the same way as new, um, uh, you take the value, you take phi um, plus zero y, that function, right, is a constant function, is transverse to the zero section. And so that's what we're going to use here. We're going to um, take now we're going to give, give the df. I want to show how to um, I want to show how to locally around the point make df transverse to the zero section. Um, so um, I'm not inter assuming an intersect or anything, but um, so I don't. the ball e, um, and n. I want to trivialize T star m over B. So the T star m over B, as in this case it's gonna be isomorphic to um, this ball B cross R um, cross R N. Space. This is the fiber direction. And so we know that um, you know for for some for some small well what do I want to do? I want to say for some small um, <coughs> B 
in our end, df, uh, df restricted of all b plus b plus this plus this vector b um, is transferred to the zero section. So when I say plus b, I mean I'm thinking now df is a map from b into b cross rn. Maybe I should really do plus. Um, you understand what I mean? Just picking out the vector. And I'm adding the adding this direct. I'm adding a vertical direction. Right? Um, but I'm just adding a constant vertical direction. But the point is, a constant vector here, right? So if I'm adding a, all I'm doing is adding a constant uh, cotangent vector to df everywhere. And that's the same as adding a linear function to f, right? So that's, so this equals, um, this is f plus, uh, it's d of f plus some linear function. And l is a uh, linear function in local coordinates, I mean, by th this trivialization dependent on local coordinates in B, and so the definition of constant here depends upon that local coordinate, right, because I think about what the, how these coordinates relate to these coordinates, and that, of course, tells me what linear means. So this linear is totally a coordinate dependent um, uh, uh, thing. So if I'm willing to just add a linear function to f on this ball, then I can make it um, transverse and I can achieve uh, the, the Morse law. Um, I mean, I can achieve the existence of Morse functions, but the problem is that adding a linear function is not something that, um, uh, you know, that linear function gets bigger and bigger and bigger outside this, outside this ball. Um, it can be spied on. Um, so, um, all right. So now, how, how can we, so, so the idea, the, the other thing though is this is a small vector. So like the slope of this linear function is very small. So what I want to claim is that, um, well, so suppose instead I add, um, let me call it, instead, I want to add so things like L tilde, which is a um, damped off linear function. I don't even try to write down, but you know, you use a bump function. But let me just draw you what I would mean in one variable. Um, so L is, the derivative of L is small, right? So, you know, the picture in one dimension captures the idea that it's, it's got small slope, right? And then I want outside some, in, this is all happening inside the ball, and I want to air it off so that it becomes so if you multiply a linear function by a bump function, you get something like this. Of course, you can make that bump, now you, this, is where, this is where the care has to be done. You can make that bump function very steep, or you can make it have small derivatives as well. And the goal is to make it kind of have small derivatives. Um, so why? Well, so first of all, if you do this, um, then, then, then this is somehow, um, so d of f plus l tilde will be transverse to zero section in inside a, you know it won't be transverse in 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 uh, b but it'll be transverse in <coughs> some slightly smaller b right so this whole thing is the ball b over there then there'll be some smaller ball b tilde right inside b tilde There's some smaller ball inside with me? That's like where the bump function is one. That's where the bump function is constant, is one, right? So I've got this linear function that I want to add to perturb things. I've got this bump function, and it's a bump function to off, right? And um, so inside this smaller ball, I'm great. I get a transverse. So suppose you did this in one ball. Now you screwed things up possibly even worse. What you want to argue now is that is that when you do this in some one ball, then I go to another ball, and I've got two overlapping balls where I'm going, where I've already achieved transversality on one ball, and I want to do it on a neighboring ball and not screw up the transversality of that. How do you know that you haven't introduced some? I, might, I mean, for the moment, 
all I've done, I may have made things hard, even much worse, right? What I want to argue now is, my, my goal now is to argue if it was already transverse here, I can make my choices carefully so that I, um, if I make, if I choose my epsilons, this is, this is the wishy-washy part that I want to try to convince you. How do you know it's already transverse there? You're saying you can Oh, no, I'm saying, okay, so now here's my manifold. I'm going to try to make df transverse. So first, just one ball, okay? I make a trans, it's, it's just who knows what it was. I don't know what, what behavior it had. Elsewhere, I make it, I make it transverse inside this ball. Now it's when I get to the second ball that I start to think about it was already yeah, transverse, right? So I've got it. So here it is transverse. <coughs> that's B total. That, well, that's that's something that I've already done. Okay, that's that's okay. that's the first B total. Okay. okay. Now here comes my second B tilde, right? And here's my second um, B tilde. So that was this was B tilde number one. In B tilde number two, right? And what this would be, everything's cool if, so I can get this transverse, everything's cool if I don't <coughs> screw up transversality. If I can argue, make some argument like that, then I can keep going and I only ever care about compact manifolds, so fine. Okay. Um, and so there's where I need to make an argument for you that if I've managed to um, achieve transversality on, um, on some set, some open set, and then I have some other ball that intersects that open set, I can achieve transversality, I can make some progress. Um, there's a the more traditional way to do this that bypasses this is, um, is, is to try and do it globally all at once by embedding the manifold in Rn or some large n, and then doing some, sort of adding some global linear function that's defined globally in terms of the global coordinates. And, and that works as well, but I sort of, I want to, I think it's it's nice to think about it from this point of view because it's not depending on, on that um, heavy, but um, so um, so what are the issues? The issue is that you don't want um, you know it, this. Okay, I'm no analyst, right? But Here's my naive understanding of epsilons and Dallas's arguments. You know, you've got things fighting each other, right? You've got progress fighting. You know, um, and, and epsilon and delta are somehow fighting each other. So, the first thing, you, what you would like to do is um, say that the um, you, you you'd like to say that if this cutoff part is not too steep, then you won't screw up transversality, right? And in some sense, all that matters is some of the magnitude of these derivatives, right? Um, so it should be not too steep with respect to how steep this is, right? And so um, I've already gotten, what, what you really want is some measure of how far away from non-transverse things are. Ideally, you want to say that, and that should be basically the, um, you know, there's that, if you want to do it carefully, you should actually be able to find, and this is not the picture I have to be drawing things in, um, you would, uh, ins inside, um, inside your local coordinate chart, B, you have Rn. Right? That's, that's the thing I add to it, but just in general, we've got something like this. And we, we, you know, the way I think of it is some angle theta. Right, of course, this high dimension so is a little bit misleading, right? But there's some angle, which is there's some appropriate measure of how how steep this is, right? And if this is steep enough, or this is shallow enough, right? When you're adding that together, you should not be able to. You know, if you add a small something with very small derivative, you're not going to get it back down. Um, and so the. So what you could say is I want to do this always so that I always add enough, a big enough linear function that I'm, what you want to be is bounded away from non-transversality, right? You want to tilt this, you want to tilt things enough, use a big enough linear function so that you're bounded, reasonably bounded away from non-transversality at some angle. And then you want to cut things off, though, in a way that's bounded away in the other direction. It's not too big, so it doesn't screw that up. And there you, you know, what's, it sounds hopeless, right, in a sense, to try and do, um, but the only thing you have, 
working for you is that um, these uh, the, the the thing you have working in your favor is that you can play around the relative radii of these um, balls. So you can have balls. You you can have sort of a relatively. You want this to be relatively steep, and you want this to be relatively shallow. And the claim is that by by always doing this, you know, by choosing by making a careful epsilon delta argument with sort of um, steep enough linear functions to keep you make sure you're always bounded in, where you are improving things. Make sure you're always bounded away from non transversality by a large enough amount, and then gentle enough, um, you know, wide enough region on which you taper things off so that wherever you um, wherever you might possibly be screwing things up, you don't make it too much worse. Um, then if you put those two arguments together, I claim that, and you don't have to believe me, you can try it yourself, I claim that you can sort of carefully play around with the various competing factors there and argue that you can make progress one piece at a time and, not, and always keep yourself bounded away by a constant from non transversal um, But you know, I, I didn't <coughs> plan on preparing it the full epsilon delta details. Such things exist. If you don't like it, then you embed all of the manifold in Rn, and you do a similar argument, but now you have to be sort of, what, what, if you want to embed it all in Rn, you then want to, the nice thing is that all of Rn has a trivial cotangent bundle. And so you want to sort of figure out, you can add some linear functions to define on all of Rn, and you do this in one fell swoop. This seems like completely hopeless if you're not. Uh, yeah, except that I think, you know, I don't think it actually is completely hopeless, but... The, um, the school, you're saying the same true, but there's... Yeah, uh, or you can, I think even the proof that I'm giving can be done carefully, because you sort of... Because um, it seems like you care about, like, whatever that... Right, you, know, you might think... You, you need to know something about the number... What of you want is locally, steps. you need lo locally compact the critical. You don't want you don't want to you don't want to uh, keep you don't want to keep hitting this instantly many times, right? Because the point is like open yeah. tests that are really far away shouldn't affect these. Exactly, right, right. right. So as long as you as long as sort of at any point no more than twenty seven balls intersect, and you can take like then you know then then you have some you know this this thing should never do more than one twenty seventh of the worst possible um, you know moving away from you know, just, There's sort of um, there are lots of them because I said you, know, you get these linear functions you can add in the in the end you're adding one function right you're adding a fu function over and over again but in the end you're just adding one single function and um, uh, these functions came there's sort of a whole range of different linear functions you could add to it so um, lots of but, um, so I want to start thinking now about um, one parameter families. And see how much of that that does it. So the first thing I want to do is um, uh, think about what transversality means. I guess I guess before I said any of that, the, the, other, the other thing about the other thing that follows immediately from this transversality interpretation of Hessian is that critical points are isolated. Right? Just I mean we, you sort of well, if you have the Morse lemma that implies critical points are isolated because we have a local model, and in that local model the critical point is isolated. But also because it's a transversality of it's a, because of the count dimensions, you're mapping uh, you know, it's a transverse intersection of two n-dimensional things inside two n-dimensional. Therefore, the intersecting points, therefore, the critical points are isolated. 
Okay. Um, and then you can think about thinking about that. So if if d f sub t is transverse to the zero section for all t, then um, you can think of I would think of d f sub t around that as being a function from suppose t is you know defined state t is an R or an integral around the origin or whatever you want. So d f sub t, I'm gonna think of it as um, a function from R cross n, maybe I should call some other notation for this, but anyway, into T star n. Uh, into, I don't want to do it in R cross T star n. Think of that as a bundle over R cross n. It's not T star of R cross N, because I'm not taking the cotangent directions in the R direction. So the picture is that you sort of have I think of M coming out here, and the cotangent directions, the star going that way, and this is T, right? And then this is the, we now have a sort of a Z, we have a zero section from R cross M into R cross T star M, which sends, that's, that's again the zero section. And so this transversality um, <coughs> being transverse for each time T means just that the um, now means that, uh, so what I should say here, I mean I should call this, let me call this tilde. Put a tilde there. And so this is the original Z. And so for each fixed time, T is transverse. Um, but then if you think about it, um, knowing that df sub T is transverse to the zero section for each time, will then imply that df tilde sub T is going to be transverse as a function from R cross M to R cross T star M, the function of transverse to the sort of tilde zero section. How is that? Well, you always have the um, R direction in, I mean, you, you know, you need to know that tangent spaces to the two sub-manifolds still span the whole thing. All you've done is you've added one extra direction to the tangent space here and one extra direction to the tangent space here, and the whole thing you added one extra direction, but that direction is just the T direction, so you still have transversality. In fact, now you have, you, you, you know, now you've doubled the T direction, right? You've got the T direction represented in both of these, so this is n plus one dimensional, this is n plus one dimensional inside two n plus one directions. So the inter dimension, the intersection now is one dimensional, which makes sense, right? So now we've got, um, you know, your, your intersection is going to be pretty, your nearest point of intersection. So this is going to be the intersection of the point we have tilde sub t intersecting z tilde um, along arcs. Um, and that's, oh, but, but those arcs are, move, all have with, uh, all with non <coughs> Zero t so in other words, that all that's saying is that or what we all along, we've got these points, these, these critical, these isolated critical points, and then they move around here. Right? Um, but the reason I wanted to set it up this way is I want now to think about what happens if um, this is kind of very it is is that the only I guess what I want to think about now is so what I said is if at each time it's transverse to the zero section. That implies that this uh, this tilde versions are transverse. Is the converse true? And I think the converse is not true. So if df tilde sub t is transverse to z tilde, you can have other things happen. In particular, what can happen, you can have a transverse intersection in this extra direction where two critical points come together. And that can be transverse in this sense 
but at this fixed time, so the, the, reason that, the reason there's a transverse intersection here is you still have um, one of these, the z tilde direction, is still giving you the t direction, right? Because you always, the z tilde zero section always has a t component. So for, at, at this fixed point in time, <coughs> df tilde sub t, it doesn't have to, you know, give us any t direction at all. Um, and, I mean, say that, right? And you sort of can imagine some sheet, like the graph of this thing is coming down at some sheet here where it's sort of continuing. It, um, and so it intersects it here on something like that. And that's what I'll try to explain next time. So this does not necessarily imply that um, FT is transverse to Z, well T. But when it doesn't, I claim that we're getting exactly that we have the we have birth or death. So this birth or death thing is also going to be the transversality of a certain time, where two of these critical points come together. And um, uh, at this fixed time, this critical point is not, I mean, this, the derivative df is not transverse to the zero section at that fixed time, but the sort of sheet of, z of dfs and sheet of zero sections are transverse. That's the picture I want to try to clarify. It seems like something we've sort of seen before. What's that? There's, there's, there's oh, yeah, we have, we've had, we've had, sort of we, we had this sim same idea for, for there's with, like with the flow lines, right. 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 Yeah. But I mean, yeah, they, you know, this is a completely standard idea, right? What, what's, what's important is the classification of one manifolds, right? Knowing that one, you know, I've got one manifold and I've got a time direction, then the one manifold, actually it's, it's Morse functions on one manifold, right? I've got time project, you know, project, I want to understand how this one manifold behaves in time, right? So I've got the time function on this one manifold. And either they just keep going forward or they come back and it's round. Mm -hmm. So what were those two things, the last time you asked us to write down things we'd like to see, what were the two that you said don't bother to write down? Oh, what I'm doing right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Then you actually can get that to me by Friday, that'd be good.